Welcome back to another episode of Season 5 of the RAG Podcast. As you guys know by now, this is the number one podcast across the recruitment sector globally. And we've always been on a mission to help recruitment agencies grow by interviewing founders and telling their stories of success from startup all the way to scale up and exit. Well, this season we're a little bit different. How do you as a recruitment leader and founder maintain your family and friendships whilst being the best person at work? How do you stay physically fit mentally and emotionally? And how do you find time for yourself in the madness? How do you find time for self-interest, for hobbies and self-improvement? Well, to help you with this, I'm going to be interviewing someone every single week that can demonstrate experience in one or more of these areas. So I'm going to talk to recruitment founders and also some experts from outside the industry who can deep dive into things like relationships and health and well-being. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy today's show. Hello, guys. Welcome to another episode of the RAG Podcast with me, Sean Anderson, the CEO and founder of Oxmo Media. Today is the 8th of December, uh, I believe. it's the. Uh, it feels like the world is changing. Things are, all it is is talk of Christmas parties and what have you. Um, and I'm super excited to be delivering live on LinkedIn, the second to last, the penultimate show of the year. Um, I'm lucky today to be joined by a guy called Lewis Marley, if you don't know Lewis. Lewis is the founder and CEO of Bentley Lewis, an award-winning exec search firm. Um, what I love about Lewis is he's also the host of podcasts. He's got two shows called Don't Take Out Your Phone and another one called The Recruitment Show. Um, we connected a few months ago. I felt like we just got on. We saw, we see the world in a similar way. Um, and what I love about Lewis is his confidence. He said he's building the best exec search team in the world, and he's flipped his model a lot in the pandemic, and he believes it's for the better. Okay, so let's get into today's show. Let me join Lewis. Welcome to the RAG podcast. Thanks, Sean. Thank you very much for having me. I just oh, made it. Just I in just time. Made it. Yeah, just... I wasn't, I'll be honest. My, my, <laughs> yeah. I don't bite my fingernails very often, but you got me to the edge there. You're um, like that, Lewis. Like, I know. I was like, but... Lewis, are you going to be ready for 11.45? He said, uh, I'm on the way back from a client. We'll see. <laughs> um, Someone wanted to actually meet me face to face. I mean... Wow. You know. well, we've got a lot to talk about with the, you know, the world. Uh, the amount of posts I'm seeing at the minute of like my first face-to-face meeting, my first event, and I'm like, oh, how long is that going to last with the current news? Um, but before we get into today's, you know, economic world and all the rest of it, give us an intro. I've done a basic introduction, but tell the world who you are and, and a bit about Bentley Lewis. All right, so I'm I'm Lewis Malay. I'm CEO and founder of Bentley Lewis. So we're a global boutique search firm. Um, and it's been almost 12 years now, come up to 12th year, um, set it up on my own from a basically like a tiny little room in the West End. Um, right. My cousin owned the building up in the West End, um, a milliner, so a hat lady, had the top floor, gave me half of it, had a tiny little table, had a W1 address. And I was like, yes. Okay. Um, so it was really good fun. And then I, I worked for another firm before um in recruitment for five years and then i had a prior career in fashion and manufacturing wow and i did chemistry at university wow. so it's been really like that. it's been a journey it's been yeah. a journey you know like a what, lot of what people you, what moved you from fashion into recruitment so after chemistry i was a year modeling liquid crystals in the lab with the headphones on no one spoke to me i'm like mm, no. not really my thing mm. so i set up my own fashion distribution company worked in manufacturing and then i was like want to do my distribution company properly and a friend of mine was in the recruitment sector and it's really interesting right you have people on on either side different wants needs desires influences it's a real interesting consultative sales process um it's about making friends good relationships it just it just kind of got me and i, I met a firm there were like five six people lovely bunch and went all in um yeah. and then five years after i was like want to do my own business happened to be in the recruitment sector think I'm good at it. You're not sure until you start your business whether you really are or not. And and then it's just been like it's been really nice and rewarding building something. You know, it's been wow. really fulfilling. So. so you say you five year you did five years for somebody else. Yeah. And what was the trigger? When, when was the point where you realized you're gonna go alone? So after 
I think like throughout, I always wanted to have my own business. So just forgetting being in the recruitment sector. My cousin is a ladies wear designer. My parents are immigrants into the UK. Mm. I just had this thing and I saw my cousin build his business. From 13, I was packing boxes and folding plastic bags in the showroom yeah. and just watching him build something. And I just got that, that thing. Um, and then, yeah, and then the recruitment stuff was amazing. And then it was like four years in, I think it was, you know, I want to, were you doing exec search then? No, contingent recruitment. Right, in what market? Uh, insurance and asset management. Right. Mostly okay. insurance, mostly insurance. Mm -hmm. um, Mid-senior level, you know, like it was the Wild West back in those days. It was like 2006, you know, there was no LinkedIn. People were getting cheered for coming back with the phone book from Deloitte or EY or whatever. You know, that, that, that like, yeah, yeah. like great kind of training ground or whatever you'd call it, but just... Yeah. You know, I had friends working in recruitment there. The phone would get sellotaped to their head. The chair would get taken away for not making enough calls. I mean, it was like, you know, yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. I, The guys took me out for beers on my first day. I got home. My mum was like, how was it? And I was like, oh, I'm not going to make it. Yeah. It was like really crazy kind of thing. And then, it, it, you know, you got into it. And then it was the thing with insurance is it's all in the same postcode. You got to make. Yeah, I know. I, I used to recruit into the Lloyd's market. So I, I know. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. It's yeah. great, right? So you cruise around EC3. Were you doing, like, were you just doing underwriters and brokers or were you doing... So my focus was internal audit, risk right. and compliance. Like right. that was my thing. I started with internal audit. Mm -hmm. um, they gave me a little bit more responsibility and started to to manage the risk audit compliance. I'm sure team. we work with the same companies. I used to do the change management space. So be a project management, project management, but it might be a risk of compliance project or a technology project or a business change. But um, I, thought I, rec I thought I recognized you. Yeah. <laughs> it's one in round, so one in round the market on a Monday lunch. <laughs> yeah. But it was great fun. I mean, it was it's a great industry to to recruit in. It is. And it was just great. And I and I love the actual recruiting. And but there was something missing for me. It was it was just building something. I wanted to jump off the cliff and you know, I spoke where to your, a few... where was your life at that point? Like what would how would you describe your life outside of work when you took the plunge? So I wanted to start my own business before I got married. That was my thing. My girlfriend had moved in at the time, who's now my wife. And I thought to myself, I was like 28. Uh, yeah, 28, because I'm 40 now. Um, and it was just a great time. I was like, if it doesn't work out, go get another job. You know, there was no no like fear of failure. Um, partly because I had a lot of US family and it's not embarrassing to fail in the US. In the UK, mm. it's a bit like, oh, what happens if yeah. it doesn't work out? And you kind of surround yourself with people like that and you never end up doing anything. No. And so I, I yeah, kicked off and it's wow. been great. I love yeah. it. So take us back. So you in that desk in that top floor, 12 years. Or two, what year was that then? 2009? 2010. 2010. 2010. That was just before, or while, while the world was in a pretty difficult spot. Financial crisis. Yeah, yeah. like people were, if you, yeah, I'm sure you remember the time. It was like yeah. people being made redundant, financial crisis, that, that really, really like a bad time in the economy. But and, um, you start a company then? Like you said in your introduction, what a wonderful time to start a business when the economy is just like, it's the same, right? Financial crisis, COVID, it just gives you an opportunity. Like rent was like near free. Bank accounts became free. Like you could set up your business for, for, for much lower cost than I would have done a year or two earlier. Yeah, yeah. And and you're coming in when other firms are unfortunately struggling. Mm -hmm. And you only need a little bit of business to do well. Yeah. You know, yeah, you need to rub the sleeves up and you're not you're not you're not trying to manage a huge cost base or anything, are you? You're just like you're no, agile, you're nimble. Yeah, you're excited, you're fun, you know, it's like, right, let's go. I just want to have a quick word from our sponsors. So today I want to quickly mention District Four. Um, I've been talking about these guys for a while. They are a, a support network for experienced recruiters who want to take their own um, plunge into owning their own agency, right? So they've got this impressive startup package um, and they take care of the back office technology and support. So you can do everything that you've got at, which is, you know, providing this excellent service to your candidates and clients. All expert recruiters working as business owners under one umbrella. They are looking to help people, you know, kick, kick on in early 2022 regardless of what's going to happen with the pandemic, I still believe this is an amazing time to launch a recruitment company. And I don't believe 
um, many of us would like, like we really enjoy doing things alone. So you should speak to these guys. Worst case scenario, they're just going to tell you, you're not right to launch a recruitment company. Here's their honest advice. Best case scenario, they're going to help you shape a business plan and uh, and make your dreams come true. So get online at www.district4.io and find out there. Did you set out to be an exec search firm at that point? Or what was what was the vision at, at the time? So I wanted to be a global boutique search firm. And I'd done, obviously, as I said, I'd been all contingent. I'd started to do like heads of, but it's a very difficult thing. Like if you're known for contingency, very difficult to go into search. You know, you, you, cl- you hear the classic kind of contingent recruiter be like, I'm going to try and sell a search. You don't really, you know, really you're not selling a search. It's, it's a real different different vibe, mm. different experience and stuff. But I'd, but I'd done like senior stuff. It was interesting. And and that was like where I felt comfortable. And But it took a while to transition. Like it really did. Like everyone that knew me before wouldn't use me for a retained search. So it was really setting about building a new a new network. Um, and then over time, the network I'd built started to... But did you know, you know the really process? Like, did you have... I know you don't recruit them, but did you... Were you even familiar with the full search process? Yeah. So we'd done... as a great lady called Sarah Shears. Um, oh. And she'd done... She's a really, really, really great search lady. And she did a bit of training. And, and just before I left, uh, we did a bit of search training. I... I spoke to her quite regularly. So I was I was well versed in like the process, you know, the proposals, the pro- catch up, the, the whole kind of like five star service. Um, but once you start diving into it, that's when you really learn. You know, you need to find your vibe. Um, you know, every client's a bit different. They like to work differently. But you, you learn as you go. You know, it's taken me a, it's taken me a while to, to really transition uh, to it properly. It doesn't just happen cool. overnight. So how did you go about it? You say you, your current client base didn't really wouldn't respect you to do that anyway. So where did you go and find business? What was your approach in the early days? So so day one was I did a list of twelve hundred companies in London I wanted to recruit for, and just went from A to Z. That was like bucket one. So my first client was Aberdeen Asset Management AB, and mm. and I and I, I really started like that. You know, it's like unglamorous picking the phone up going to speak with people. And then it suddenly it clicks. Really, the game is about um, making friends, like being patient. You know, so much of the time, it's like short term goals, you want to make a quick fee, you want to like, certainly in that contingent world, it's really short term, mm. until it clicks that really to make a lot of to do well in our industry, whether you're doing contingent or search, you have to have a have a long term view, you have to be patient, you have to give a great service, you have to be kind to people. You know, it's a real, it, it, once that clicks and, and you're patient, then it gives you time and you can mm-hmm. and can really focus on on doing good work. Um, and that's, it, it clicked. And then and then that's what I focused on. And then everyone I meet, it's, you know, I do exec search and people then start to, to know you for exec search. You don't do the other stuff because that's not like my game. And yeah. and then you start to- Did you have any pressure financially that first year? Were you under pressure to to make money? I saved enough money to cover my rent for the first year. Right. What about your yeah. life? What about your life costs? Yeah, I'd covered my. I covered like for for one year. For one year. Right. And so yeah. and so. Whatever happens. Yeah, and so remember. So after if it didn't work in that year, I was like, okay, cool, I'm out. Mm. Like I've done, I've done a good. You know, I've done my best. Yeah. But but remember, there's a transition. So when you're doing contingent recruitment, you're not going to start getting search work from day one. No. So there was like a blend of like some contingent some search some contingent some search and then you do that to, to get the revenue in um you pick what contingent work you want to do you know you try and do exclusively the right level heads of whatever and then after a couple of years you find that the whole mix just it just starts to to move to search because you're you're turning down that work and you're very gradually you know transitioning out so it's definitely a game of patience like you've yeah. got to take your time and how did the first year financially go for you? How did you perform? It was great. I think we did like we did like one hundred and fifty thousand pounds of income or something. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was it was great, you know. Because remember, when you start when you when you're working for a firm, you earn about a third of what you generate, roughly. Mm-hmm. So I was like, you know, I'm doing three hundred. I'm earning a hundred. If I just do a hundred in my own firm, y- you know, and then you're like, okay, what do I need to do to do a hundred grand? And that's like 
eight grand a month. Yeah. You know, and you're like, okay, that's, you know, and yeah. we're, we're doing searches with fees that command a lot more than that. Mm. So when you, when you break it down and you do the numbers and you, and you, and you back yourself, then, you know, you're in a good spot and then you just crack on. Yeah. So did you stay all, all by yourself then at that point? Did you um, think so I was, hiring? My, yeah. My first hire was my mum. Go on. And <laughs> Tell me story about that one. So, hey, when you when you start your own business, right, you're, you're not really a business owner. You're a sole trader. You're sure. like HR, sales, finance, marketing, yeah. cleaner. I was like cleaning the floor upstairs and the thing, right? It's not, not glamorous. And then you realize, you know, you need to outsource stuff and you need to focus on what you're great at. And so my mum had retired as a teacher a year or two before, maths teacher. Um, I didn't want to do the accounting, the finance chasing invoices, anything like that. So I'd, I'd got um, an accountant from day one, outsourced accountant. And then my mum came in to do all of the stuff that isn't revenue generating. And it, yeah. and it let me focus on the stuff that I'm good at. Um, and then I hired someone for my old firm. And then, you know, then it started to, started to go from there. So so when, when what did you, so your mum was just helping out with general different tasks? Invoicing, yeah. invoicing, chasing invoices. We have, you know, the PL stuff, costs, tax returns, VAT, all of that stuff that actually takes quite a bit of time if you're going to do it, right? Well, did you, you said you wanted to be a global search firm. So did you have, a, yeah. what was your plan around people back then? Did you, did you think I'm going to keep growing heads and get to 50 or whatever? Did you have a, did you no, have no, a, no, target was just to be a little bit better than I was yesterday, you right. know, to, to, to be the best search person I could be, um, to make money and have a good impact on people you know and then there were my goals i wanted to be a, a global search person so everyone i spoke to I'm like we're a global search firm we'll be a global search firm about six months in someone believed me and i got uh we got our first we got cfo search in in switzerland i think it was right and that was our that was our first like international role because coming from like recruit contingent recruitment in insurance in central london you get very like narrow you know, it's like London, London, London. And then yeah, suddenly you start to do stuff internationally and it's it's amazing. You know, like I love meeting and speaking with different people. They have a different perspective, different context. Like it's really interesting. And all of our clients were global and, and they started to, you know, want to work with us wherever it was in Europe and the Europe was the focus. And then you start to deliver and then your network grows. And, you know, because we were, you know, we're doing senior search work, the candidates are clients, the clients are candidates, you, you know, it's, it's like, but you don't even think of it that way. It's again, like building friendships. And if you do a good job, people would like to work with you again. And then that's how it's, it's continued. So. So has it been a very word of mouth business, would you say today? Is it built it's over been a, everyone talking about you in their own circles? I think it's been a real mix. I think, I think a really good search or contingent business, um, you know your customer service has to be five star right like you want to get referrals you want people to use you again it's much easier to get repeat business from current customers than it is to go out and win new work cool. and if you think about how many coffees or video calls or phone calls whatever it is it takes um with new people to generate new work there's this business development triangle it's something like 97 percent of people you speak to aren't looking to buy from you from for a million different reasons and 3% might be. And so why would you not focus on, you know, making friends and doing a great job? It's just, mm. and so, so, that, so that's been a real focus. And then there's the new bucket. Obviously, I want to be meeting new people all the time and people then become friends and you do work. And so it's that ongoing thing. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. So you, you, you do 150 in year one. Your life sounds pretty cool. Pretty, you start to hire your mom and a few other people. Well, how did the business progress then over the next few years? How did it, as you, as you got a bit more, to, I think year two is a different year because you've you've got more to lose in year two. Like year one, you, like you said, you, if it don't work, you're gone. But in year two, you've got a bit of a reputation. You've got a bit of a business. You might have someone you employ in. Pressure changes, I think, and beyond. It becomes a different company. The game changes. Yeah, yeah. the minute you start hiring people and paying salaries, they get the game changes because so much of it, you know, I was an individual contributor at my last firm. You know, I was, it was all about I, mm. you know, I did well, I made money. It was just me. Like there was no, my targets were me. Mm. It was just, it was all I. 
And then the real, when the penny drops it, it's not I, it's we. And it's about what I can do for my team, not what they can do for me. Uh, and it takes time to adjust, right? Like, you know, you go to school, if you go to university, if you're playing sport, whatever, it's so early on in your career, it's all I, right? Yeah. If you do well individually, you'll get promoted to manage a team and maybe you get... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's, so for me, it was like, it, it clicked about, you know, it's about, it's about we and it's about what I can do for them. And then, you know, then I think it, it gets really good if you, if you focus on the team. So when did you start investing in growing the team properly and thinking like it wasn't it wasn't just about you? When did you think that that started? I'm sure talk us about the tell us about the trajectory of the business. Yeah, so in terms of people. So yeah. um, my mom, um, I hired someone from my old firm. I think just about just before the end of year one, um, we worked together. She wanted to come over, and it was great. Mm. And then we started hiring people. I moved into the city um, beginning of year three. Uh, the dates become hazy now, but we moved into uh, Lloyd's Avenue. Yeah, so and again, we're doing a lot of insurance work, and then and then we, we start to hire a few more people. So we have got three, four, five, six, um, and then you're like, wow, like managing people's stuff, you know, like it really changes. It's like you've got to win work, you've got to deliver work, you've got to make sure they're doing this uh, training and making sure people are happy. It was a really big learning curve, yeah. and we got up, we got up to. I think we got up to 14 or 15 people about four or five years ago. And, and it was tough, you know, like, they all, I, are they all producers or are they resources? Like whatever mixture. You yeah. Like mixture. Researchers, yeah. Mixture. Some are helping deliver work. Um, some were, you know, winning work in their own area. And everyone was in London. Like everyone was in the office in London and it was just classic, you know, come in 8.30, 6. Like it was real, like what you'd imagine a recruitment yeah. firm in London to be like. Yeah. And it was tough, you know, lots of different personalities. Over seven people, suddenly politics comes into play. And it was a really tough moment, actually. Like it was it was a, one of the biggest learning experiences I had. And it, it wasn't fun, actually. It wasn't that I, I probably, yeah, no, I didn't really enjoy it. I hired like, I probably didn't hire the right mix of people you know um and and so then we we kind of reorganized a little bit you know and then we went down to like i went down to maybe 10 9 10 people and it was really good and then i was like you get caught up like a lot of people when you start a business they're like when do you want to sell how many people have you got and a lot of that's vanity i think yeah. it's like does it you know just gonna have 20 30 50 people doesn't mean you're mean making any money mm. and then it's like thinking about being happy um you know making sure the people that are working with me are happy and my, my mind and, and my focus changed a bit and then it was about creating a really great environment that people want to work in and they're happy working in and i didn't get caught up in how many people it was if we found great people we'd hire them if i didn't i don't mind and and that was that was the mindset and that's still the mindset was your, but as you grew to that 10 15 back to 10 how did your role change as a were you still forward facing client facing doing the job as well as trying to run everything else do you did you hire people around you to do operational stuff like how did it all fit together yeah so uh so my mom was like office manager -y, all of that stuff we had an accountant which we still have and then i was client facing as well so i was i was doing both um, and we had a little bit of structure you know they weren't all reporting to me at that moment but um but i'd not done it before you know like you learn uh, and that's cool you what know would, what like, would you say the biggest mistakes you made like what, what did you screw up in that process I, I don't know if it was a i wouldn't change anything if i'm honest because that's my that's been my journey you know what, like did, I've learned, did you look back and go i learned it was it was the wrong thing to do but I've, i'm glad i did it because i learned from it my make my biggest thing now and this might sound a bit corny but i want to hire kind nice people biggest like number one thing now like believe in the mission kind people um maybe a bit quirky you know before it was um you know like this classic salesy you know have they done sales before have they work and then they're on sport you know you get like a lot of like yeah. a lot of the contingent recruitment firms are looking for those types of people same type of people yeah you know same type of people and i was like why am i doing that you know i just want to be happy i want to have a good life i want to make money along the way i want to help other people um and but it but you don't i didn't arrive at that i didn't arrive at that until i'd gone through that experience so i wouldn't change it 
Yeah. You've mentioned I want to be happy on a number of occasions already. It's probably the first time in 25 minutes into an episode anyone said it three or four times, right? Um, it's quite interesting because I think most recruiters, recruitment owners are, are all about growth, all about vision, all about, you know, how do we get to 100 heads, 200 heads, sell, all the same sort of mission. And whenever I talk about happiness, usually it's like, well, you know, we'll be happy when we get there kind of thing. Like that's kind of the mindset. You can't be you happy say that. We'll you say better. that. But I've watched a few of your shows. Um, don't ask me which ones. And they've said they actually weren't happy when they sold. That's the point. Yeah. So they're like, we'll be happy when we'll, they think they'll be happy when they sell. And then so many people tell me they're not. When they sell, it's the worst year of their life. Like, so how did you come to that conclusion at such a, you know, early stage that you were like, well, and what does, and you say I want to be happy. Can you, can you categorize what happiness is for you? For me, healthy. Uh, for me, it's like, I want to go in smiling every day. You know, you just want to, life's short. I mean, if COVID's taught you nothing, mm. it's like life is short. You never know what's going to happen. Things change so often. What are you waiting for? You're waiting for some a big event that might make you a few million. But in our industry, you can make really nice money and a good living along the way, right? But, but again, it's not just money. It's money and purpose, right? The really cool thing about what we do is that we can help people get jobs you can have an incredible impact on society. That's my like, you know, that's my thing. It's like really nice to place someone in a great job and see what they do. And and, and that that gives me happiness. Um, I, I enjoy, you know, for me, it's I, I really enjoy meeting people and all of the like the stuff that comes with doing a, a consulting job that we do. Mm. Um, I love I love um, I see my friends and my family all the time. Um, and then I spend an awful lot of time on my exercise, nutrition and sleep. I wow. diarize my exercise like it's the most important meeting of the day. Really? And, How do you do it? Yeah. So I do CrossFit and I either do, I either do um, 6.30 a.m. Uh, or I do 7 p.m. So right. I flex it because my wife likes to do it too. Right. So um, on a Sunday night, we decide when we're going to do it. Um, but if you want to get into it, there's a great guy called Eric Partaker. who was right. the founder of Chilango. Do you remember Chilango? You know, the Mexican food yeah, yeah, yeah. places yeah. around. Yeah, he yeah. found a Chilango. He came on my show a couple of years ago and he does an alarm. He's got an alarm on his phone uh, and it goes off at like 6.30 a.m. to remind him to be the best person at the gym. Mm. His second alarm goes off at 8.30 a.m. to remind him to be the best CEO. And then his third alarm goes off at 7 p.m. to remind him to be the best husband and father. <laughs> quite you know extreme thing but yeah, wow yeah. right you know that alarm goes on your phone and you're like switches and you're like okay cool right i'm i'm the dad because when you're running a company it's all in right you're all in it's yeah. your whole thing and so and that's fine like I, I love it and other people do too but you have to have other things in your life to unwind and stuff like that our second sponsor today is volcanic the number one website provider to the recruitment industry around the world. Um, following their recent success of, of a client called Camino Partners, who won the best new website award at the, the Noras, they've provided some amazing insights on how they've used their website to both elevate their brand, celebrate consultants, and position themselves as an experts in the sector. Now, you can read all about this on Volcanic's website, um, volcanic.com. Um, they're also offering a free MOT to any RAG listeners that are sat there thinking, do I even know if my website is any good? All right. If you want someone, experts to look at your website and give you the, the ins and outs of what you need to do to make it better in 2022, then go to www.volcanic.com forward slash Hoxo. How many hours a day do you put into the office and in, well, into recruitment? Because it doesn't have to be the office anymore, does it? Oh, mate, my, my, my whole company has completely transformed um, from COVID, like the, how got, it looks. We'll go, in, go into that in a minute. But, but just how many hours a day do you put? Because you've got, you got a lot going on. You, you know, you've got a partner. You've got kids as well, right? Three. Three kids. You're a husband, you're a father, you're a business owner. You're trying to be fit. How many hours a day would you put into the, the business bit, the recruit, the, the search, the team, that? Oh, man, like, I'm... I'm I mean, it's my life. Like I do, I do work in the U S we do work in Europe, you know, it's emails, it's messages. I mean, I'm not like, I don't, um, I don't like switch off or, no. you know, so I'm up at, I go up at six. I do, I take my kids to school. 
which yeah. is really nice. Many more dads at the school gate now. Um, I either get into the office or back to my home office here at like 8.45. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, let's go. And then the US obviously comes online later. So I'm finding I'm doing a lot of stuff after. So I flex it. But that's cool as long as I'm doing my exercise and stuff like that during the day. So, for example, it might be, you know, like I've got calls in the morning, calls at night. Let's do like a 12 p.m. CrossFit or yeah. let me go out and have a walk or something, you know. Or if I've been at home, I need to do a fake commute so I can get my steps in or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that feeling. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I, I've been really good this year. I try and give myself lunch times, like oh, not today when I'm doing a podcast, but. I try and go out between 12 and 2 and I go and do an hour in the gym and then I come home and I eat and I decompress and then 2 o'clock I crack back on. But I start at 8 every day, work. Um, and I'm up at about 6 as well. Um, it's, an, it's a full-on day. It's a full-on day. Um, but so many people just... I, I, I think they just... They forget that there's other parts to their to their life than the what than the job, but it's but it's how do you are you present with your kids when you're taking them to school or are you thinking about the search later on? No, I I I try and be present. The biggest the biggest killer is this. Yeah, because they can get you anywhere, right? It's like you're drunk. Like as in as in if I'm with my kids and I'm on the phone, I might as well be drinking. You know, like yeah. it's it's really sucks your attention. So. Yeah. I try and be mindful of that. Like the school, the school thing's great. Like we get on the bus, we get on the train, I take them to school, we have a chat, I get them dressed in the morning. Uh, if I'm working at home, I can put them to bed. So it's nice. And then on the weekend, you know, I'm with them and we're doing some fun stuff. So it's a bit of balance. Like they know, you know, they know I'm running a company. They, I mean, seven year old is starting to understand and asking questions like, how does that work? Mm-hmm. What's business and how do you make money and you know what do you mean you find people jobs like how does that work so it's quite grounding you know because you want to be you want you want your energy levels to be to be high you know you need to be in a good mood and it's so difficult to keep everything moving though it's so hard but i do i do you know i think it's great what you're doing in terms of the pre-pandemic bentley lewis tell us about that what did it look like pre-pandemic so we had everyone in London and one person in New York, like we just set up Mm. um, our U S company based out of New York. And uh, I was on a taxi on the way back to JFK airport end of Feb. And I heard COVID the word COVID for the first time. And on the radio, I'm like, what's this COVID landed. And I was like dragged last man out of the office. I'm like, okay, this is never going to last past May. Never. And then obviously it did. And, and then it was it was tough. Like um, so, Kelly, who runs um, our North American office, is awesome, brilliant lady. Um, she got COVID early on. She got four kids. It was a real tough moment to set up a company in the US. And about August, all our clients called us, by the way, at COVID, and was like, "Don't don't rush on those searches." By the way, mm. <laughs> and you're like, uh, "Okay, right." And then and then you go through an amazing experience in hindsight. It's okay. How much money do we have? How, yeah, how much money were you? Were you like? Did they pause on basically? How much? What are we talking about? <sighs> I can't remember. We had we had retainers. So remember, like they retain us now. So we're at the point where it's almost all uh, all of its exec search rates. So you do you get a little retainer, varies maybe a third or a bit whatever it might be, and then um, and then the rest on completion, right? So you're waiting for this stuff. So we had quite a few things on on the go, and then it was paused. And then money runs out really quick, you know, rent in London, salaries, and you're like, you know, oh, shit. And so you you, you take a moment because it's so easy when it's going well, right? But mm. when you're facing... How many people that, did you have? How many people did you have at that point? Uh, there was like eight, I think eight of us or so, eight, nine of us. Still an so office not, in... Not crazy. Lloyd, still Lloyd's Avenue. Uh, Throgmorton Street by the Bank yeah, of England. By the bank, yeah yeah and so i managed to get half price rent and like we did you know we did some cool stuff and then august well actually sorry june july all those searches started again so we were like okay great we can start seeing the money come in and then from august 2020 probably even i mean even now like it's been the busiest time ever touch wood a lot of i mean you talk about it great resignation and lots of people hiring and a lot of companies cut too deep now they're trying to rehire 
a lot of people now have moved from like reacting to being proactive and things are happening. So, so then it suddenly switched super quick. And so the US has been great. We have three people there now. We're about to open an office in Toronto and Canada. And then, um, and then we have people in Berlin, Lithuania, London. Wow. Um, so it's really gone from everyone in the office to almost everyone's remote and but a much better culture everyone's closer you know we do some really cool stuff i mean it's really it's probably one of the nicest moments i've had uh running the company in terms of like the culture and the people and what made you shift it then so three months or so till when the world really was in the pandemic say april to june did you was that what when you know the weather was lovely we're all in london i remember it really well we couldn't do a lot you know no idea when we're gonna actually get out of this mess it feels like a lot of people made decisions in those three months and thought about how they wanted to live their life and how the business would be shaped. I know I did, you know, I left London and Poxo went, we, we handed notice in our office and we went, we went fully remote and we still are. We've just got, we work licenses for people that want to want them. Um, yeah. You know, so it's, we've got a very similar journey. Sometimes I wonder, did I make a knee jerk reaction in that three months that perhaps I should have waited a bit longer before? Um, Cause you know, three months in, a, in your life is, is not much of a much of a time frame. What was it like for you in that period? I think a lot of people made very quick decisions. You had this whole council culture thing, mm. you know, like there was, you had like the George Ford stuff and, and, and it was just that whole moment in time, yeah. people, it felt were making very quick decisions about things. And, and COVID was one of them. Uh, countless, countless companies that treated their staff really badly over COVID. And this yeah. great resignation, by the way, is only a great resignation from bad companies with bad cultures that don't yeah, treat yeah. their people properly. Yeah. The great companies aren't having that problem. No. Um, and so a, a lot, lot of people made bad decisions thinking yeah. about their business and their shareholders and not their people. Um, so I just tried to think about, you know, I wanted to keep everyone. I want to think about the people. How can we keep everyone? What can we do to make people happy? It took me a while to appreciate that everyone was going through a different experience, you know, different personal scenario, different home life, people affected differently. And so, yeah, I started calling, well, I called everyone every day, you know, my team, checking how they're doing, five minutes. I thought it was annoying for everyone. They're probably all watching, but I thought, <laughs> I thought it was annoying for everyone. Like, oh, no, Lewis is calling me again. But then they were like, after a while, it's like, I really like you calling and stuff. So that was really nice. And then we do a 2 p.m. call every day, which we still do half yeah. an hour, unstructured, positive, stuff like that. So we really started to implement some really nice stuff. And yeah, it just transitioned. And I wouldn't go back now. You know, clients don't mind where we are. Yeah. Um, we've been doing international work for a long time anyway. So, you know, now we have in, in the US, it's like Miami, New York, Philadelphia, Dallas. They work from home. They have a WeWork membership. If they need it, you know, the app, they can go. Um, when COVID clears, or oh, it won't clear, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, we'll do regular meetups in Europe too. We'll meet up every quarter or whatever. Are you? So, what are you doing? Because when we spoke last time, you had, didn't you turn a flat into an office in in London? Yeah, yeah, that's it. So, so the office in Throgmorton Street was really expensive. Mm. Like real estate in London is expensive, and and I thought, does anyone really care that we've got an office by the Bank of England? No. And pre pre COVID, it kind of meant something. It helped me attract better people, I think. Um, I don't think it. I honestly don't think it does. Maybe not. Think, no, I don't think. Maybe it not. Does. You know, but that was that was the that was the like the perception. ego kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, the perception stuff. And then the clients. Where's your office, Drug Morton Street? Always felt like it helped. But and I asked my team in in London, like, do you want an office? And and everyone wanted a spot you know spot to come in and interact with each other no one wanted to be like completely fully remote i don't think and so i got got out the contract and um and we rented an apartment in central london and it's a spot for the team to come in if they want they can sleep there they can work there it's a space for them and it's like an apartment it is literally an apartment slash office yeah it's apartment it's an apartment yeah mm -hmm. i mean I, we, we made some a friend of mine's an interior designer she helped create some really cool workspaces um the vibe's really nice it's about like you know it's about your work you know the, what experience you have when you work i think you know whether it's you're coming into a, a space like that 
whether it's your you'll be able to do these kind of calls with people speak to your team how do you communicate i just start to think about the whole experience that people have when they're working at bentley lewis and, and i start to think about that a lot more from covid how many people can fit in that apartment well old school recruitment style I mean, we could probably we could probably spit back to back like 25, 30 what people. What about now, though? What, what would you have on a given? Uh, would you ever have uh, a day where there's a few people in? Two, three, yeah, max. And I'm not, and I'm not, and, and no one has to come in. Hmm. You know, like gen genuinely, you can you can do whatever you want. You know, the, the you kind of I moved from, you know, you move from time in the office. You know, like, where's John? He's late. It's 8 30. He's supposed to be in, you know, or you get the text message saying, Oh, I'm really sorry, it's snowing. I can't make it in. You're like, you live the closest in the office. You know, you yeah. get all those things, you know, pre COVID, right? And now it's like, it's just about output. I don't mind how long or not people work. It's yeah. just, you know, let's have fun. Let's do a good job. And so it's a, it's a big mindset shift. Makes sense. Makes sense. So now, how do you juggle it yourself? How often are you in there or at home? It took me a long time to get used to it because my whole working career was in the office at 30. Mm. Don't leave until six and then yeah. stuff around it. And, and I've always stuck to that, even when I was on my own, because I, I really like oh, yeah, routine okay. and discipline. Exactly. When, when, when that gets thrown on its head, you're like, uh, OK. And, and so I started. To, so I, I still stick to that broadly, but it took me a while to get used to working at home because I like getting out and I like moving and stuff. Mm. And I always felt like I needed to be in the office. Otherwise I wasn't really working. Like working at home wasn't quite the same. It just took, took a while to adjust. And now I'm flexible. You know, I look at my diary on a Sunday. Sometimes I have meetings face to face. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I want to go in. I drop the kids off. I hide and head into the office. Mm. So, so now it's all, if someone's coming in, we decide to go in on the same day. So I keep it a bit more fluid. Um, I'm a bit, I still work just as hard. I'm a bit, yeah. I mean, it's just, it just took a while for me to adjust to it. I think if I'm honest. It just, it just sounds like you've, you've got a really positive outlook on based on what's happened, right? You, I don't know. You just, I, you, I just get like a positive vibe from you that, you know what, you've, you've took the, the, the situation that was difficult and you found positivity in it. And you see, and you look happy. You genuinely look happy. Whether you make, you might be making it up for the show, but you look happy. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> look, man, look, you've got to, right? You have. I mean, you just if you're now not happy. Your, you're how is your business structured now? Then, so talk us through. Like sure. one of the things I think people are interested in is exec search when they're doing contingent recruitment. Like how how is it structured? What I know you've got a marketing manager. You're running a podcast. You're doing. Tell us about your model as much as you can. So. And I thought I put my phone on silent, by the way, so my apologies. Oh. Um, so we have a chief marketing officer called Amira, mm -hmm. who's awesome. Yeah. And she's uh, been here almost three years. And, and and like you guys are doing, and I think what you're doing is awesome. The content marketing thing we like quadrupled down on. Mm. And she's great. So we do a lot of content marketing and all of this kind of stuff. I've got Kelly, um, who runs our North American platform. Um, then we have um, I have someone in Lithuania who's central and eastern Europe, a guy called Giovanni, who's great, a lot of tech and digital. Um, we have a really nice research team. Maria works on all of our stuff. So we've got a mix of delivery people, and we have a mix, and then we have like what you'd call classic business development, but I don't really like to call it that, but consultants, mm. let's say. Um, and every search is a team game. Like every search, there's two or three of us working on it. It's really about the experience. Um, and that isn't woolly or fluffy or it's it's genuinely like every single bit of the process needs to feel good for everyone involved, you know? Um, what, five star what, what, service. What's the thing that can go wrong in search? Like when, tell us about the things that people, people, it sounds great. Like it just sounds great. It sounds like, you know, you retainers, big clients, great contracts, great relationships, but what are the problems that happen? Give us some examples of that. It's all about communication. If you're not aligned, like in any piece of recruitment, if you're not aligned with the client and you haven't had a proper briefing or there's other stakeholders that are having an influence, um, then you always run into problems. Always. So mm. the big, the biggest bit, like in any 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 search, whether it's contingent or not, is the briefing. You know, like you've really got to do a thorough briefing and you've got to make sure that you know, everyone who's involved in the decision-making process is, is, is in it. 
agreed. And once you're once you're clear on that, then you know you can then start doing a proper job. And you know clearly, you know candidates pull out, and you know all of the stuff that comes into into our industry. But that upfront bit is is really really important. Um, right. And it also it takes longer. You know, like when contingent recruitment, it's all about getting your person the job. Otherwise, you don't get paid. Right? It's it's sales orientated, and you can be a you know consultative and whatever. But ultimately, you don't get paid until your person gets the yeah. job. That's mm. it. So, so you have to you have to sell your candidate in, however you might do that. Whereas with with search, it, it, there's no sales involved really. It's it's consultative, right? You want the best person to get the job. You in this win 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 outcome. You know, it wants needs to work for everyone. And so, the wonderful thing about it is, once you've started a search, your focus is is just on making sure it works for everyone. Which is a really nice kind of thing to do, which is what I enjoy about it. I love that. So you, it just sounds like you're, yeah, you're just trying to wrap a, wrap the process in it with as much care and attention as possible, without the desire, like you say, to hit a number tomorrow. But what is a time frame on an average search for your business? What, how long does it take? To- <sighs> Scroll through LinkedIn and you can see people moaning about how long searches take. I mean, it ranges from. And I posted this on LinkedIn a few months ago. A friend of mine, CMO, Chief Marketing Officer, she got offered a job in two weeks, started. She called the fir- another firm that she was in the process for, which was eight interviews, two and a half months in counting. And they were surprised when she pulled out. It takes time, you know, like I'm I'm doing a I'm doing a CFO search for a listed company at the moment. And you know, they, 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 it's not for them. It's they want to find the right person, and that might take quite a while. Could be six months, could be ten months. It, so it, it varies. I think right now, um, clients, companies need to move quickly, and so I found that the recruitment process have shortened over COVID. Like people don't want to hang around. They're investing a lot of time in in these interview processes. Oh, that's so, interesting. That's yeah. interesting. Do you find that because everything's remote now? People are more open to a conversation, but they're not they're not necessarily as, as committed to to move it. Everyone wants to chat. Hmm. Everyone. Um, and what I find right now is that if the opportunity, if the opportunity is is better, whatever better means for that person than where they are now, then everyone's open to a conversation. Hmm. For sure. You know, and pretty much everyone we speak to is employed and probably quite happy and doing really well and and stuff. So yeah, everyone wants to chat to you, you know, if you, if you, if you approach them in the right way and, and things like that. Um, okay. A lot of people have reevaluated their lives yeah. over COVID. Well, what's the vision then? What's the future? For, I know you, you've talked about building a the best exec search firm, but, but what, tell us about what, you, what it looks like. Have you got any milestones you're trying to hit or any, any future that you want to you achieve? So, so we've got Canada in 2022, which would be really cool, which would be really nice. Um, I just want to be the best I can be, you know, like improve it, improve every day. There genuinely isn't a, I want to sell by 2024. I want to get to 50 people and roll it. I just, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I know a lot of people and probably every single other person comes in your show and says, I want to sell. And I want to, I just want to make money, be happy, enjoy, enjoy it. I want everyone else to be happy and make money too. And if it happens that someone wants to buy us, I'm not ready to get off the uh, off the merry-go-round. No, you know, like it's it's great, it's great fun, and a, a lot of people aren't happy in their jobs. And so, if you are, it's a real privilege, and you should be grateful for it. Um, and that's what life's about, really. One hundred percent. In terms of the um, the the kind of vision of so a lot of people call it a lifestyle business, right? Um, and it's got quite a negative perception in our sector that like you know if you're not trying to grow to 100 people you you, you you're not really ambitious yeah like, what, what do you say to that to that perception well if you want to play a board game i'm the most competitive guy you'll ever meet <laughs> <laughs> um yeah a lot of people say you know like this lifestyle business thing people people write and uh, people look use lifestyle businesses yeah they look down on it yeah. you know like no one posts on instagram about a lifestyle business no right like i think it's also with all of this tech stuff you know, like tech firms don't make money, right? Until they sell, they're raising money every eighteen months. It's a really tiring journey. They're losing money until they sell. So a lot of the stuff you see about building a business and exiting, a lot of it's from that that tech space, and they have to because they haven't they got. Have any, they don't have profit. They don't, yeah. 
then there's no profit, right? Yeah. Like you, you know, but it's like like you can be you can be on your own building a really nice recruiting business and make really, really lovely living. And that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean you're not ambitious. It's just a different life, right? I think the point for me is find what makes you happy. Like, what is it? Like, you might be, uh, th there's no right or wrong answer, right? Like, it might be you want to build your business because that's what you've always done, wanted to do, and you want to sell it. And mm. great. And that's cool. You know, if that makes you happy, then, then go for it. Uh, or if you want to be just on your own, generating revenue, working three days a week, high five. You know, yeah. nothing wrong with that either. So, I think more people need to think about like what what's their thing you know what makes you happy and then if you're happy you can do the best work you've ever done yeah you know, and you find not, that place and you're not desperate to get off the train in two years or three years or whatever yeah and also remember what i do um you've got to be in the game a long time if you're in the game a long time you get a seat at the table you keep you know it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not a quick thing an overnight you can't like you know we're doing like board level searches now would never have never have have done that 12 years ago like it does take time you've got to do all the stuff i talked about you know kind happy great service you've got to inv willing to invest all the time to do that and and it's great um and you can you know you can make money along the way doing what we do i love it in terms of today right we're, we're, we're closing out for the christmas period now i feel like everyone's starting to feel it they need that break and i don't know i feel like there's an announcement today by the Prime Minister, they're saying there's an announcement about Christmas coming out today. Omnicom varying. I was in Dubai last week and I went to Dubai in end of January 2020. All right. It's weird. And I'm, and when I got back in early February, I did a podcast with Ben Alexander, who is a owner of a company called Tech Intellect. And me and yeah. him, he was my final podcast before COVID hit. All right. So it's early Feb. So early, early March. Sorry. So Ben and Dubai kind of link to covid right and anyway, last week i'm in dubai walk into a hotel and who's in the lobby ben in dubai and <laughs> and then the omnicom virus is going crazy and i'm like is this like deja vu um what do you think what what we what we likely to expect over the next month or two what what's happening in your opinion saddest thing was my grandma lives in cape town in an old age home she's 99 in a week and my mom's flight got cancelled last sunday that's so sad she's only let out of her room for food and to take a walk in the garden it sounds like prison so so on a personal note like i want to go see my grandma yeah you know like she's been it's been a couple of years now she's 100 next year so wow. so you know on a, on a personal level it's you know it's tough for people that can't see their families and stuff like that and and i said to you all fair a month ago we'd have been like you know all good no worries yeah. COVID's life's, great. Life, life's back to normal now Life's back to normal. And then we've got this Omnicom thing. And I still think, to be honest, I mean, you're speaking to a guy that's, you know, I'm really positive about things and I just crack on with life. That's it. But I do know, you know, there's a lot of people that are anxious, that, you know, don't want to get ill. They're living with mm. people that are vulnerable, whatever. Like, you know, I appreciate that people are in a different scenario. But I think, you know, you've just got to crack on with life now. You know, be safe, keep others safe, but just get on with it. Do you see? We'll, do you think we'll go back into lockdown? Do you see that happening? Well, we already. Well, in other in European countries, they've already started to get stricter. Hmm. Um, here in the UK, we've got to wear masks on the train now. Others will get fined. Yeah, yeah. So we're starting to get stricter. I, of course, I think the government would rather not lock down. You know, like I'm here talking about how busy recruitment's been, but I'm grateful for that because there's many, many industries that have really struggled. Yeah. You know, if you're in hospitality and stuff, a lot of people have a really, really hard time. And I don't want to see other businesses like that struggle. So I want to keep things open and I want to crack on. Whether there's public pressure from the government to lock down, maybe. I don't yeah. know. Although Boris Johnson cracked on with his Christmas party, I saw in the uh, in the news I know. today. That's incredible news, isn't it? Incredible news. <laughs> so, so I, I, I don't know, Sean. Uh, will we be locked down? I hope not. But if I've learned anything, it's anything can happen. So. Wow. Um, well, look, Lewis. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thanks for you know you're a busy bloke. I really appreciate it. Um, if anyone's listened today and would like to pick your brains on anything you've talked about, your model, you know, exec search the way you've got the flat into an office is pretty cool. Are you open to a chat with them if they reach out to you on LinkedIn? Yeah, just DM me. Super happy to chat with anyone, for sure. sure. So feel free to Appreciate do that. It. Um, 
Guys, thank you for listening. As I said, LinkedIn, Lewis has been tagged in everything so far. So drop him a DM. I'll be back next week for the final episode of 2021. Um, You stay safe and I will see you soon. Thank you, as always, for listening to today's show. I truly, truly hope that you got value from it. That's the only reason I take time every week is to ensure that my audience, future and existing recruitment owners are learning from each other to make this industry that I love so much stronger. Today's episode was brought to you by Hoxo Media. I am the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media, and we are the world's leading content marketing and personal branding agency for recruitment businesses specifically. So we are working with over 200 agencies and 2,000 recruiters right now, both managing the brands, producing content, building written video podcast content for niche recruitment agencies all over the world, as well as coaching at a desk level individual recruiters in your businesses, how to be better on LinkedIn. That's how to brand themselves. That's how to produce content. That's how to use the opportunity on LinkedIn to get traffic to their profiles and turn that into business. We're coaching people all over the world every single day. If any of that sounds of interest, please do visit www.hoxomedia.com or drop me, Sean Anderson, a personal message on LinkedIn. I would love to talk to you. Tune in again next week. That's live on LinkedIn at 12 p.m. on Thursday, or you can catch the show on the following Monday from 6 a.m. on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'll see you soon.